the blood covenant. And this is a subject for me that has been a foundation in my life since 1996. Now, I had heard the teaching before that and had learned about blood covenant. But in 1996, on January 1st, New Year's Day, I was spending time with the Lord. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, take communion every day for 30 days and meditate on the blood covenant and what it means to you today. And that 30 days made a huge impact in my life. And people have asked sometimes how I was able to go to the mission field because I traveled for 12 and a half years as a single woman and I didn't have a companion. So in, in the natural, I traveled alone. But I always said that I traveled with the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and the host of angels. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And yet, in the natural, I was alone. And if you've not been in other countries, you would have a hard time understanding. But the things you confront when you're traveling in foreign nations, and even going into a foreign airport and times when you expect your host to be there but they're not there what do you do and they speak a different language and sometimes if I just waited a few hours they the host would show up or one time my second time in India I arrived in Mumbai in the middle of the night it was almost midnight and I come out of the airport and back then it was even different than it is today. Um, they've changed a lot where they've modernized, they've westernized, and even the spiritual atmosphere has changed. You can tangibly feel the difference. But back then, I came out of the airport in the middle of the night, pitch black, like almost midnight, and I'm standing there waiting for my host, and he doesn't come. And this is only my second time in the country, and I didn't know my way around. And India is exotic, very different. And part of their culture is the the boys and the men that are um, taxi drivers come up and, let me take your luggage. Let me, here, get in my car, get in my car. And I'm like, stay away from me, stay away from me. <laughs> you know, it's like, God help me. <laughs> and I turn around and I go back inside the airport and then wait and found, realize they're not coming. It's the middle of the night. What do I do? I have to find a hotel. So I, there's a hotel desk, and I just ask them to send me to help me get to a hotel, you know. And, and then going to the hotel and resisting fear, Lord, how do I get in touch with them? What do I do tomorrow? It's like, don't worry about it. Just go to sleep, you know. And these kind of experiences, and more than once, I've been left at the airport with no one showing up. And it's quite an adventure thinking, what am I going to do now? And where do I go? And how do I reach them? And, and different things. That's just one example. But you totally have to rely on the Holy Spirit. There is nobody else. No one. Because there's no one around you that you can even trust. And there's no one but the Holy Spirit to rely on. And so people have asked how... Cherry, could you go like that into foreign countries? And there was more than once. Most of the time I went into a country on the invitation of someone that I had already met in person. So I knew them in person. There were a couple times God directed me to go to a country that I'd never been to before to meet someone I had never met before. And... So getting off the plane to meet this person for the very first time, we had communicated only by email. And there again, it was by the leading of the Holy Spirit because somehow your email address gets mass spread. And I would get emails from people in different countries I'd never heard of before. And most of the time, you you just see it, delete, 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 delete. I mean, don't even give it a second thought. And yet twice... I got an email, and as before I deleted, the Holy Spirit said, wait, don't delete. And then read it, and I didn't answer, just went away from it for a few days, went back and read it again, and the Holy Spirit said, answer that. And I'd answer, and then we'd go start going back and forth. And then I could discern their heart and their spirit as we would communicate by email back and forth. And I could think, this is a right spirit. 
And God wants me to do something here. And going into a brand new place where I only met them through an email and I didn't hit delete. <laughs> and um, so then getting off the plane and then meeting him in, in person for the first time. And both of those relationships were good, strong relationships that grew and developed out of that first email that I didn't delete, you know, by following the Holy Spirit. And they were good relationships. And so, you know, it's amazing. But how? And I go back to this being one of the main, main key factors. And that is that I understood my blood covenant with the Lord. And blood covenant, actually, a marriage is a blood covenant. And so when you look at the blood covenant that we have with God, like a marriage in a marriage, when you're in a blood covenant relationship, it, it adds a confidence and a trust in that other person that you have a covenant with there. There's a trust there. Now, the sad thing is when that trust gets betrayed, but the best and the right thing in a good marriage is that you can totally trust that person. And you can be vulnerable to them. And you know you can depend on them. And then, not only that, but you can also, there's an openness and a freedom that you can express yourself openly to them. And that is the way our relationship can be with God. When we understand that we are in a blood covenant, it is actually like a marriage that we have with God and therefore our relationship with him can be one of total trust and we know that he'll never break his word he never has and he never will and we can be open with him we can rely on him we can express our thoughts and feelings and not feel like he's going to reject us or anything and so that interrelationship is what grows out of revelation of blood covenant and that relationship with the Lord. And a lot of Christians still have a fear of God. And that will hinder your faith and your trust in him. And even those who don't really have a fear of God, they haven't learned yet to what degree and depth they can actually trust him. And there's still a fear and holding back. Well, what if he doesn't meet my need this month? What if he doesn't pay my rent this month? That's what worry is about getting your bills paid is what if God doesn't come through this month? Well, that means there hasn't been enough depth of trust developed in that blood covenant. Because when you know there's a blood covenant, There's no way God can fail. No way he can fail. He's got the provision and there's no way he can ever fail you. And, and I'll bring this up because this is an added revelation. Of course, we all know God is faithful. We've said it. I love the song. Great is your faithfulness. But to me, that again went to a greater depth of understanding in my heart in about 2009. And I'd been on the mission field then since 2001 for eight years. And, you know, like I said, I left home on a one-way ticket and knowing that I needed faith to get to the next place and the next place and the next place and to get home and go out again. And I was looking back in 2009. And over that time, there were some times that it got really tight and it got really close and there was pressure. But God came through. God came through. And actually, one of those times I remember, and I don't remember the year, but it was in the earlier years, maybe 2004 or 5. I had come home from the mission field at the end of the year and preparing for the next year mission. And when I was home, the Lord had said, get some equipment. And so we were buying equipment, but we put it on credit card, but expecting God to pay it off because... I like to operate debt free. And so, okay, God, this is paid off in Jesus name, you know. And I remember I was starting to feel financial pressure and burden. And 
I remember one night, it was late at night after the rest of the family had gone to bed. And it was dark, and I got up, and I went into the kitchen, and I took out the juice and the bread for communion. And I opened my Bible. And at that time, because it was so weighing on me, and God, we need this, the finance right now. And it was weighing on me, and I just held up the bread and the juice to the Lord. And I said, God, you said. And then I, you know, shared, you said this, and you said this, and this is your word and your promise, and I've obeyed you like Abraham went out and obeyed you. And I just, you know, tears running down my face, but I was able to hold the bread. And, and it's not like I'm not shaking my fist at God. What I'm doing is I'm reminding him, as he said, put me in remembrance. And I said, Lord, I know, and I know you know I know what this blood covenant means. And I know that you keep your oath and your promises. And I'm holding it in the blood of Jesus and in the body of Jesus that you are supplying this need. And I took the communion that night and went to bed. And we had a miracle financial breakthrough in, I think it was three days, because of standing on that blood covenant. And so from 96, when the Lord said, meditate on the blood covenant for 30 days and take communion. As you do it, that became a rock foundation for my relationship with God. And everything I did, I did it because I'm in covenant with God. And God said, it's like God is my marriage partner, and he's going to come through for me. And so that became the rock foundation of my life and then gave me the power and ability to go out there to the mission field and go into the unknown, sometimes without much money, but a, a few dollars in the pocket. Because I knew he would come through. And it was because of that blood covenant. And so that's why this has been a, a very powerful revelation in my life that I still live by. And it's something that I still, I still take communion periodically. But when there is a specific thing I'm really believing for, and I've been pressing my faith, and I've been believing God... And I'm still waiting for the breakthrough. Then I'll go and bring it to that communion table. And I say, okay, Lord, now I'm receiving this through the blood and the body of Jesus. And now I'm doing this based on our covenant relationship. And I know you cannot break your covenant. (laughs) And um, I'll, I'll like to share with you actually a scripture that I go to in Hebrews. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter six. This is. When I am in that place where I'm taking communion and I'm presenting something real significant in my life that I'm trusting God for, I I use this scripture when I take communion in Hebrews chapter 6 and starting in verse 13. And I actually have put my name in here. And in one in verse 15, I even wrote cherry. In my Bible. And so in verse 13, Hebrews 6, 13, when God made his promise to Cherry, you can put your name in there. When God made his promise to Jerry and Kathy, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you. And then whatever his promise is to you, give you many descendants or whatever God has told you. Verse 15, and so after waiting patiently, and this is where I wrote Cherry, Cherry received what was promised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. (laughs) Jerry and Kathy receive. Amen. Dolores receives. Roger and Linda receive. And Mark and Zay receive. Jacob receives what was promised. And then verse 16, men swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. That's you. You are the heir of the promise. He confirmed it with an oath. Verse 18. God did this so that by two unchangeable things. In which it is impossible for God to lie. I personally believe, and there are different views on that. I believe that's the blood and the body of Jesus. 
that is symbolized by the bread and the juice of communion, the covenant meal. I believe that's the covenant meal, the bread and the juice representing the body and blood of Jesus. That by those two things, those are the things that seal the covenant. And so I see that by two unchangeable things, by the bread and juice symbolizing his body and his blood, in which it is impossible for God to lie. So it's impossible for God to lie when you are holding him to his blood. Amen. We who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. And we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. And for me, that communion becomes an anchor for my soul. Once I have taken communion, I'm anchored. I'm, I'm rooted into the rock. Once I have taken that communion, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Now it's like, okay, I've got the communion. I've got the bread and the juice here. That has anchored my faith now. I, it's like driving um, a nail into concrete. And it won't be shaken. That has become the anchor. That communion, taking that communion becomes my anchor. And I walk away from it. I'm anchored now. That's it. It's settled. It's done. It's a done deal. Hallelujah. So I look at that even as this hope is that communion becoming an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. I believe the blood has already entered. The blood has already been taken to the mercy seat. And so it has entered. And so it's a reminder of God is saying this is in blood. This is sworn in blood. It's an oath in blood. And it's behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies in heaven on the mercy seat. And God's saying, this is what I'm doing for Roger and Linda. This is what I'm doing for Jacob. This is what I'm doing for Lawrence and Julie. I'm doing it. And it remains there, that blood. And as it says in another place, you know, here in Hebrews, that blood is speaking. Amen. Remember that? Um, go to Hebrews 12:24. Hebrews 12:24. And this is talking about you. Verse 22 says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. And verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood. That's the blood of Jesus that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. That blood of Jesus is speaking covenant, Amen. covenant. Amen. I've sworn an oath. To Lawrence and Julie, you, you gotta carry it out. I've sworn an oath to Roger and Linda. It's gotta be done. Amen. And that blood is speaking on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, continually bringing your name, Jerry and Kathy, Jack and Colleen, Mark and Zay. It's bringing your name to God continually. The blood is speaking your name and saying, I'm in covenant with these people and we're going to keep our end of the deal. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God keeps his end of the deal. Amen. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. So that's the power of the communion. When you learn to take the communion and say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you based on your word and your promise to me. Now I'm holding you to it in the blood and in the body. And that's not an arrogant thing. That's a confident thing. That's a thing, that's something that you know you are righteous and you rightly belong in his face, that you have that marriage relationship with him. There's a confidence to approach him and talk like that. Like a wife can get in her husband's face or a husband can get in his wife's face. I mean, you know, you've got a right to do it because of that covenant relationship. And so you're not being arrogant. It's not being arrogant. It's being confident. And God loves it. Amen. 
He doesn't get upset. He says, that's the way to do it. Good job, son. All right, here we go. That pleases him. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Well, then with faith, what are you doing? You're pleasing God. So if you're going to him confidently saying, it's your blood, I'm reminding you in your blood, and your blood is speaking to you continually day and night. I sleep at night, but the blood never sleeps. And so the blood is talking all night long. Don't forget Jerry. Don't forget Kathy. Don't forget Jacob. Constantly before the Lord. It's bringing him to you. Bringing you to him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. It's just speaking constantly, moment by moment, for all eternity. Bringing your name and the promises he's made to you especially when you take it in the communion in the blood and the body of Jesus that's what keeps it alive before God hallelujah hallelujah (laughs) praise the Lord everybody say praise the Lord praise the Lord Lord. hallelujah glory to God well I wanted to briefly explain the blood covenant ceremony that was practiced in ancient times and throughout history even some parts of the world that are still more tribal still practice blood covenant but you don't see it very much but BC before Christ it was practiced in different cultures all over the world and I just want to quickly go through it because I want to then take it to the New Testament and to the fulfillment hallelujah So, first of all, when there is a covenant being made, there is a representative of two, maybe two tribes, two families that are going to join together. Maybe two families are joining together. Maybe two tribes are joining together. And they agree to come together usually because of considering strengths and weaknesses that each one has. And that one has a strength in one area. But a certain weakness and the other has a strength in the area where the one had a weakness. For example, let's say there's a tribe. They're all farmers and they farm, farm, farm and produce lots of crops. But not one of them knows how to use a sword. And so when the enemy comes, they always get wiped out. They always get defeated if anybody attacks them. However, there's another tribe, they're trained in war, and they are the best warriors, but not one of them knows how to plow a field and plant a crop, and they don't have time. So you'll have the warrior tribe make a covenant with the farming tribe, and the warrior tribe says, we'll fight for you and we'll protect you, and you'll provide food for our tribe. And so the farmers will provide for the warriors their food. The warriors will protect the farmers. Well, that's the way it is in a marriage. You know, the man and the woman come together because one has a strength and the other has a weakness in an area. And they meet each other's need in those areas. I think of it like I see my fingers strength and then the low spot weakness and the point strength Weakness, strength, weakness, strength, and then strength, weakness, strength, weakness, strength, weakness, strength. But when they come together, they become a fortified wall. And there is no weakness then. And they're stronger together than when they are alone. That's what covenant does. One puts a thousand to flight, two puts ten thousand to flight. So you're not one plus one equals two. You're one plus one equals ten thousand kind of. It's a multiplication of forces that then makes that wall a very strong, fortified wall in who you are. And so that's the reason for coming together in covenant. And then the representative of each is chosen. And then an animal is chosen. And the animal is cut down the backbone and split open with the blood able to run to the middle to make a river of blood in the middle between the two halves in the animal. And then as they are starting the ceremony, they stand facing each other across from over the animal. And then they would first take off the belt of weapons or something that represents what they're giving to the other person. For example, the warrior would give their weapons. They would have a belt of weapons with a sword and a knife, and they give that to that person saying, now I'm fighting for you. Maybe the other tribe would give him a hoe or a shovel 
representing what they are giving and contributing to this relationship. And they would trade those. In other words, it is saying my strength now is your strength. My strength will be your strength. And I will fight for you or I will feed you. I will take care of you. And I give myself to you. And my strengths and my abilities, I'm giving myself to you. And then they take off their robe and a cloak of some kind that represents their position or authority. And do you remember when Jacob gave Joseph the coat of many colors? And then Joseph's brothers were jealous. They weren't just jealous because he was a favored one and was given a gift that was really nice. I mean, they could have all gotten, they were wealthy. They could have gone and gotten their own beautiful coat. It wasn't just that. It was actually what the coat represented. It represents authority. The coat or the robe represents authority. So when the father gave the son his robe, He's saying, I'm passing my authority to you, which means you're going to be the next chief. <laughs> so now all the other brothers are jealous. You mean you're picking this twerp <laughs> to be the next chief? <laughs> yeah, the robe was passing on the mantle. We also call it a mantle of authority and position to him. Like, wait a minute. So it's not just a pretty coat. This is mantle. This is authority. This is position being passed down and the father selecting the one who is going to take over in his place. And so that's why that coat was so offensive to the brothers. Not just a pretty coat because they could have all gone out and made their own pretty coat. But that represents position and authority. And rank. And so they would do that. They would exchange in this covenant ceremony something that represents their position, their rank, their authority. And they would exchange that again saying, I'm giving myself to you all that I am, who I am, what I have, I give to you. And then they would walk through the blood and they would make a Sideways eight, they would walk up the middle through the blood and go around one half of the animal and then come back to the middle and walk up through the blood again and go around the other half of the animal. And I saw that one time. It's a sideways eight. Well, you know, in mathematics, the sideways eight means infinity. Infinity. So there's a symbol of infinity being drawn through that walk of blood, meaning it's forever. This is an endless relationship now. Praise the Lord. And then they would stop in the middle of the blood. They would make their oaths, their vows, their pledges to each other. Their promises of this is what I'm going to do for you. And the blessings of the covenant would be declared. You'll be blessed with this and blessed with that. And then they cut themselves either in the hand or the wrist, not a small cut, but a big heavy cut to make blood flow freely. But also because that scar needs to remain visible for the rest of their life. And thankfully today in marriage, you don't cut your finger. You just put a ring on. <laughs> a ring is the symbol of that. But that ring actually takes the place of the scar. The ring you wear in marriage is taking the place of the actual cutting of the flesh so that there's a scar. Now you just wear it. And thankfully, it's not so painful. <laughs> <laughs> How would you like to go into the church on wedding day and, all right, stick out your hand. <laughs> Cut and all this bloodshed and call the ambulance. She passed out. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So then they would make that easily flow because they wanted the scar. And I want to say something else about the scar because after the scar heals, for one thing, that scar is to be a reminder to you that you have a covenant. And that's why you want to always wear that ring and it puts you in constant remembrance. I'm in a marriage here, you know, 
But also, it's to let other people know. It's to let other people know. For example, let's say that they are walking through the woods, and the farmer is out there alone, no weapons, and the enemy sneaks up and is going to try to attack him, but he sees a cut. Like, it's going to stop and wait a minute. Who's this guy in covenant with? Because if I go after him, the covenant partner is going to come after me, and I better know if I can deal with that or not. Well, you find out he's with the warrior tribe. Uh-uh, I'm not going to touch that fella. <laughs> you know, well, it's the same way with marriage. You know, another guy looking at your wife, you want her to be having her ring on because that's the symbol in our society that she's married. She's taken. <laughs> and it lets other people know that you're in a covenant. And it's a reminder to yourself that you're in a covenant. And then that scar then is to be permanent. And then they exchange names or um, they join names. There can be the hyphenating the two names together. If Jones and Smith get married, they can do Jones hyphen Smith. Or in our culture, it's the lady usually takes the name of her husband. And either way, there's a name exchange. And then there is the covenant meal, and they offer each other the bread, and they feed each other the bread. Now, in our weddings, we have a custom of cake. Now, people often would just start getting funny with the cake sometimes, and playing around, and maybe smeared on his face, but... It originated as a covenant meal. This is the bread of the covenant is where the cake started. And in saying that, you say, this is my body. Take it and eat it. This is all that I am. Eat of me. Everything I am and everything I have, I give to you. And then they exchange the cup. And we often still take a cup of punch and give each other the cup of punch. That, again, is symbolic of the blood or the juice, the wine of the covenant. And it's the covenant meal. And they would drink, offer to the other, drink it, saying, drink my life's blood as I drink your life's blood. I am offering you my life. And then from that moment, relationship is born and there is constant remembrance. And do you remember in 1 Corinthians 11, the communion? He said, do this in remembrance of me. When Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, most Christians don't even understand what he means. He is not just saying, remember how I suffered and how I died on the cross for you. And that's usually what people think of in their mind as they are meditating to ready to take the communion. And of course, you know, it says that, You've got to make sure your heart's right. So you say, Lord, forgive me if there's any unknown sin in my life or something. But then you say, Lord, and you're thinking and meditating. What most people do is they start thinking on the, on the thorns, on the scourging, on the bleeding, on the suffering that Jesus suffered. And they're thinking, oh, Jesus, that was terrible. Oh, Lord, those thorns thorns on your brow and the blood dripping down oh the the uh, spear that pierced in your side and the blood and water that flowed out and oh those beatings on your back that ripped open your flesh jesus and those nails in your hands and your feet lord you did that for me yes it's important to remember that yes it's very valuable but that is the beginning not the end And that's not the focus of our remembrance. The focus of our remembrance is what did that do? What did that start? It started a covenant relationship. And now what is the result that I'm in covenant with you? What did those stripes do for you? And so that's where you start thinking, by your stripes I'm healed. I receive newness of life. I receive resurrection power in my body, in my spirit, in my soul. Lord, you are my source. You became poor so that I could be made rich. And that's where I started meditating in 96, thinking, what does this do for me today? How is this to affect my life day by day? It's not just something that happened 2,000 years ago. 
What's the result in my life day by day? What do I have because of this? And so I began thinking on you are my life. You're my strength. You're my breath. You're my energy. You're my healer. Those stripes bore my sicknesses and diseases. So I don't have to have any and I don't allow any in my body. You know, those you died and became poor. You were you were lost everything there so that I would have all my needs met. You were separated from God so I could be drawn near to God. You went to hell so I could go to heaven. You suffered shame so I could receive honor and glory. You were went down so that I could be lifted up. You were made sick so that I could be healed. You were made poor so that I could be made rich. You suffered shame so I could have honor. And you think of what we call the great exchange. The cross has become the place of the great exchange. But what's the result after the cross? Now we live in that resurrection life. Now we live in that newness of life. It's the after the cross effect that we're supposed to be remembering. And yet so many Christians don't even know there is an after the cross. (laughs) So many Christians are still living right at the cross. And they're just thinking, oh, he died. Oh, he died. Thank you, Lord. I get to go to heaven when I die. And that's all they know about the cross is that it gets them to heaven. But what it was is it was an exchange. And he took every part of that curse, every facet of that curse. He took fear so you could have faith. He took sorrow so you could have joy. He took pain so you could be pain free. That exchange that took place right there at the cross. And now what's this remembrance? Remembrance of the covenant. Remembrance of the newness of life. Remembrance of the resurrection power. Remembrance of the healing made available. Remembrance of all my needs are met according to his riches and glory. Remembrance that I am, I am, I'm lifted up into the heavenly places and seated together with him in the heavenly realms. You know, it's that place that we are supposed to be continually remembering and remembering and remembering. I have a living, vital relationship with the King of Kings, with the Lord of Lords, sitting at the right hand of God. You know, and where is this? Where does this put me today? This puts me over the top. I'm not under the barrel. I'm over the top. (laughs) I'm in victory, not defeated. And, And that's the remembrance that he's wanting you to remember. And don't get stuck at the cross and, oh, the blood. I mean, that's powerful. And you thank him for it. Yes, you you start there but let that be the beginning of the journey but keep going and going and going and receiving all that comes from that covenant that you have you are now in a blood covenant relationship with God hallelujah hallelujah it's a living relationship it's a living covenant and as we already went to in Hebrews that blood is speaking 24 hours a day 60 minutes every hour it's speaking your name before God's face Roger 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 and Linda remember Roger and Linda and so you don't have to wake up at I mean lay awake at night the blood is you don't have to lay awake at night the blood is speaking your covenant part before God continually so that you can receive everything that's the reason why Jesus died He didn't die so you could stay where you were in that place of suffering and defeat and just think about how bad he suffered. He died. He said, now go on and receive everything that I gave, everything I paid for. It's paid for. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's paid for. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so. The relationship is born, and that's what the constant remembrance is. Do this in remembrance of me. And I want you to think of that when you take communion every time for the rest of your life, remembrance of the covenant and all that it paid for. And that's what I did for 30 days. This is what it paid for me. It paid this for me. It paid this for me. It paid my healing. It paid my this and this and this. And you think of it. You think through it. This is what it paid for me. And keep that covenant in remembrance hallelujah hallelujah and so the covenant is and the relationship is born now i want us to go to the new testament and see where jesus fulfilled that ceremony that i just pictured for you and starting with we are here in hebrews so let's look at hebrews 8 hebrews 8 
and verses 10 through 13. This is the covenant, verse 10, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. See, this is covenant talk. This is covenant talk. I will be their God. I'll be everything they need. And you know, when I see the word God, I have learned to understand that as being source for everything. Source with a capital S. And and I've said this sometimes. Who is your God? You know, Christians will automatically say, well, Jesus is our God. Jehovah is our God. But it actually comes down to when you have a need, where do you look? Do you look to the credit card to pay a need? Do you look to the banker? Do you look to your husband? (laughs) If you're saying... If it's always, honey, I need this, honey, I need this, then has your honey become your God? (laughs) The source for everything you need, is that where you look? Or have you learned to go first to the Father? And wives can learn to first go to the Father and then discuss it with their husband, but always making God first. Amen. Amen? Amen? And... Same with physical pain or healing. I mean, it's fine. Doctors, medicines are fine. But what's first? Did you first stop and say, Father God, I look to you. You are my healer. That's first. First. What's first? And it's the first place you look when there's a need. And and the thing is, to a lot of people, God is so far out there. He's kind of untouchable and unreal that they first go to what they can see and feel in the natural. They go to their friend, their family, their spouse, somebody that they can see and touch because that's more real to them. But what I'm saying is that this covenant makes God more real. This covenant relationship is what makes God more real. And so that you can easily go to him first before you talk to anybody. Amen. Amen. And so when I say God, I'm always thinking of source or first place you look. (laughs) Who is your God is who is the where is the first place you look? Amen. Amen. Well, let me read it from here. And God said, I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. That's important. If God has forgotten your sins, then you also forget your sins. Once you have brought them to the Lord and I've heard arguments, you don't confess your sin. I did a week of teaching on that. The Bible says you confess and you repent of sin. And that's for Christians. Not just for unbelievers. That is for Christians. But as I heard a man of God say, God spoke to him. And he said, when you confess it is when you get rid of it. Confession of the sin and saying, Lord, I'm sorry I did that. That is what lifts it off of you and it breaks it off of you forever. It gets rid of it. And then another preacher said, admit it, quit it, forget it. (laughs) Just admit it, quit it, forget it. Over. And then don't bring it up again because God has forgotten it. You can forget it too. Hallelujah. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. So we see there is a new covenant established now in the blood of Jesus. Now, as we had said that this covenant is bringing two representatives together, I want us to understand that Jesus is called the last Adam in first Corinthians 15, 22, first Corinthians 15, 22, it says, for as in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. And then going down to verse 45, verse 45, first Corinthians 15, 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The word Adam means man. Jesus came to earth as a man. And 
there's a lot of religious ideas that are wrong when people think Jesus did miracles. Jesus walked on water because he's God. And that you ask him, how did Jesus walk on the water? Well, he's God. Well, Philippians 2 verse 6 says that being in very nature God and a footnote there says this is one of the strongest assertions of the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is deity. He is God. Being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And that word grasped means to cling on to or to hold to. So this is Philippians 2, 6. Even though he is deity, being in very nature God, deity, he did not consider his equality or his deity something to be held on to, to be clung to. But the, verse 7 says, taking the very nature of a servant, he came and was found in the form of a man. So he laid aside deity to become a man while he was on earth. So that what he did while he was alive on earth, he did as a man, not as God. Because he had laid aside deity, he did not hold to his deity or grasped, cling to his deity, but he put it aside, taking on the very nature of man and of, of a servant. And that's called Adam. Well, he did not have a sin nature, but the first Adam didn't have a sin nature when he was created. When the first Adam was created, he was sinless and he was perfect. So Jesus came as the last Adam being really exactly like the first Adam. Sinless and perfect. And yet he was still a man. Adam was a man. And Adam was capable of sinning, and he did. Jesus was also capable, but he didn't. As Hebrews also says, he was tempted in every way, just as we are, but he was without sin. Jesus was just as capable of sinning as any one of us and as the first Adam. He was exactly like the first Adam. And as I taught this also in the series on the resurrection, Jesus actually had to pass the very same test that the first Adam failed. He had to pass that test. So the first Adam in the, in the image of God, sinless, perfect Adam. And Satan comes and tempts him and he sins. The last Adam had to come and be a retake of the same test. Do a retake of that same test that Adam failed in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus faced the same thing in the the wilderness for, for 40 days and 40 nights. The same temptation that the first Adam failed. But he did it and he passed the test. He didn't sin. So he was capable of sinning, just like the first Adam, but he didn't do it. He passed the test. And the Lord showed me that is what qualified him to go to the cross as our Savior. Because if he didn't pass the test, he doesn't qualify as a Savior. Right. 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 Wow. If he didn't pass the test in the wilderness, he didn't qualify as our Savior. So he had to take the test and say, okay, you qualify. Now you can go to the cross and die. It's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> one test just to go die (laughs) but the wilderness qualified him for the cross hallelujah so he passed the test he was man in every way capable of sin like anybody else but he didn't he was tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin hallelujah and there are more scriptures than that the others that said jesus said um satan has found nothing in me His own witness. Pilate said, I find no reason to condemn this man. I mean, he had man's testimony. He had the Holy Spirit testimony. He had his own testimony. He had three testimonies right there. He was perfect and sinless and there was no fault in him. Hallelujah. 
Yeah, the voice of the father came down. Right. So here was a sinless man. And so in Philippians 2, he was made in the very nature of man. And therefore, getting back to the covenant, he made covenant with the father as man making covenant with God. So the covenant is at the beginning of the ceremony, a representative from both sides is picked. God, of course, is picked representing deity. Jesus was the representative picked representing man. He was the last Adam, completely sinless, qualified. And then as the last Adam, he represents the whole human race. So man and God come into a blood covenant. It was not God and God making covenant. It was man and God making a blood covenant. One man representing the whole human race, and it was Jesus Christ, the last Adam. The last Adam meaning the man representing all mankind. The man representing representing all the human race. So Jesus is our representative. Say, thank you, Jesus, for being my representative. (laughs) Hallelujah. And what that means then is that Jesus was the last Adam representing the whole human race as man making a covenant with God, deity, God and man coming together in a blood covenant relationship. But the exciting thing is that because Jesus is sinless and then exalted to the right hand of the father, that covenant will never end because Jesus will never fail the covenant and the father will never fail the covenant. So because neither party will ever fail that covenant, it becomes an eternal covenant. It's a covenant forever and ever and ever. Now, if you and me, if we had entered that covenant, we'd have it broken before sundown. (laughs) You know, but because Jesus was our representative, he'll never, ever, ever fail that covenant. He'll never break that covenant. He'll never sin. And so that covenant remains eternal. Hallelujah. Our man in heaven. We have a man in heaven. We have a man in heaven representing us and he's never going to break that covenant. So our covenant with God is eternal. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Woo. Praise the Lord. That makes me excited. Praise the Lord. And then what's exciting and what's awesome. Well, let me give you some scriptures before I go to the next one. Scripture. First Timothy two, five and six. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Hallelujah. And I'll just skip the rest of those because the next part of that ceremony was the sacrifice and they had to pick an animal. Well, it's amazing and wonderful that not only is Jesus the one representing man who gets the cut, but he's also the one that then becomes the animal and lays down his life. He is then the sacrifice. And so Jesus is our sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God. So he was the unblemished, perfect sacrifice. And then Hebrews 9, 25 and 26. He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And Revelation 5, 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. And so Jesus, he first stands on the side as man's representative making covenant with God. But then he lays down his life and becomes the sacrifice that is killed for the cutting of the covenant. He is the sacrifice and man's representative. And then in that covenant making, you exchange the coat. Isaiah 61, 10 I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with 
garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. God gave us his robe. God gave us his robe of righteousness, his robe of redemption, his robe of his authority. I mean, all of that is what God has bestowed upon us through the blood of Jesus. We are, we are clothed and arrayed in the garments of salvation and arrayed in the robe of righteousness. And then, of course, you know, exchanging the belt of weapons and my strength is your strength. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17, we have the armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God, the belt of truth, the feet shod with readiness of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so all of that armor was God's armor. God gave it to us. God gave us his armor in this covenant said, okay, here's all my weapons. Here's all my armor. I give it to you. And then as they would say, when the warrior was saying to the farmer, here's my weapons. He's also saying your enemies are my enemies and I'll fight for you. I'll defend you even unto death. Well, Jesus said, your enemy is my enemy. Even if I have to die, I will die for you. And he did. And Satan was our enemy. And Jesus took our enemy as his enemy. And he died so that we could live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He died so we could live. He took our enemy and he fought our battle. And he won it for us. And gave us the victory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then... The exchange of names, we have been given the name of Jesus. And, well, first of all, let me remind you that in Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, it says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth is named. We are named in the family of God. We're named in the family of God. But then also, actually, the Lord reminded me in Ephesians 1, 5, that we have been adopted as his sons. Ephesians 1, 5 says, actually, the end of verse 4 says, In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So we are brought into his family and adopted as his sons. And then we have his name in John 14, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the son may bring glory to the father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. So he has given us his name. So we take on his name. But, you know, in the Old Testament, when God made covenant with Abraham, and usually if I'm doing a full teaching on it and I have it available, it's the series I did on the radio the blood covenant, and I did it for one week, and I covered more detail. But I started with God making the covenant with Abram. And it's amazing to think that we know the name of God in Hebrew. Well, we would say Jehovah. They say Yahweh. But actually, in the Hebrew, there are no vowels. So it's Y-H-W-H. It's four consonants. Y-H-W-H. And nobody really knows how to say that name. God spoke that name to Moses when he said, I will pass by you and declare my name. That was when Moses said, show me your glory. And he said, I'll pass by you and I will declare my name. Moses heard that name. God said his own name. And since then, I think Moses passed it on to the high priest. And the high priest would only say it when he entered into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. He would say that name. That was only the time he would ever say that name. And other times, the Hebrew people, they would never say his name. They only said the name. The name. The name. They called him the name. They wouldn't say his name. So how his name was pronounced, we don't know exactly. But it's Y-H-W-H. Well, I see it like this. It's breath. What is spirit? Spirit is breath. Both in Hebrew and Greek, the word spirit is also the word for breath. In Hebrew, it's ruach. And that word is translated both spirit and breath. In the Greek, it's pneuma, panuma, I think. You pronounce the P. And it's both spirit and breath. Spirit is breath. Breath is spirit. God is spirit. 
Jesus said, my father is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So you could say, my father is breath. So if you would hear, that's his name. He is breath. He is spirit. And the primary sound we catch is the H. God changed Abram's name to Abraham. He put the breath right in the middle of his name. Abraham. Abraham. Same with Sarai to Sarah. Put the breath at the end of Sarah's name. So that they took the name of God into their own name. But guess what? God, what I'm excited about is what God did. God took their name. And from that moment forward, or actually through the generations, he became, he was first known as the God of Abraham. Then as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not just God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, he took their name into his name and identified himself, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, taking their name because he's in blood covenant with them. Hallelujah. So we enter into covenant relationship with God. We enter into that relationship when we get the name of Jesus. We get the name of the Father, and he can go around saying, well, I'm the God of Cherry. I'm the God of Roger and Linda. I'm the God of Lawrence and Julie. He's, he's your God, and he's, what he say, says, he's not ashamed to be called your God. God is not ashamed to be called the God of Jerry and Kathy. He's not ashamed of that at all. He gladly takes that title. Glory to God. He takes your name and identifies himself with you. The God of Jacob, the God of Mark and Zay, the God of Dolores. He, he's not ashamed to be called your God. He gladly bears that name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. The name. He gave us his name. And then he became our covenant meal. And we are going to look at Matthew 26 when we get to start receiving our communion. Matthew 26, 26 to 28 is when Jesus had the last supper with his disciples. And um, I want us to go. This is one scripture that I look at when I'm taking communion in John chapter six, John chapter six. And then we're just about ready to receive our communion. John six. And look at verses 53 to 56. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55, for my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, get this covenant relationship, remains in me and I in him. Now that's covenant. Remember in John 17, Jesus said, I will be in them. They will be in me. And I'm in you, Father. You're in me. We are one. That's covenant relationship. And when you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you remain in him and he remains in you. There is that bonding of that covenant. And then the seal of the covenant, you know, that scar that never goes away. Well, in the Old Testament, I'll just remind you quickly, in John 17, God commanded Abram to take circumcision. And he said that the circumcision would be the sign, he said in verse 11, the sign of the covenant. Well, in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. Verse 29. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. Circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. And then also Ephesians 1.13 
And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now, I fully believe that just as circumcision left a scar in the body, when you get saved, when you get born again, there is a scar, a circumcision of the heart. As it says in Romans 2.29, circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit. Your heart gets circumcised. Your heart gets marked by God and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that scar, that seal, that mark, that circumcision inside your heart, it is visible in the spirit realm to every demon and every devil and every angel. Amen. I believe they can see in the spirit and they can look over a crowd of people. Oh, there's a circumcised one. There's a circumcised one. There's a, that one's marked. That one's got the seal of the spirit. That one's got the seal of the spirit. And they know who are the people of God because we are all Scarred and sealed by the circumcision of the heart, the seal of the Holy Spirit on the inside. Hallelujah. Praise God. Say, I'm marked. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit in my heart. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then finally, God has given us all of his strength. And all of his ability and all of his power, all of his provision, it's all ours. And that's what we meditate on when we take communion. But also God had, there was an area of weakness that God had. Believe it or not. There was especially one thing that he really, really, really wanted. He wanted sons. He wanted sons. He wanted a family. He wanted children. So you fill in his need and desire for children. You satisfy his heart. You satisfy his heart, his desire for children, for sons called by his name. You are the answer to that, and you are the satisfaction of that desire of his heart. Hallelujah. But this is one more thing I want to say. That we remember, you know, our enemies are defeated. We receive the victory. We walk in that covenant living relationship. But in any covenant, there's the equal giving of each one to the other. In marriage, it's the same. And this is something that I also meditated on in those 30 days that I saw, Lord, I am now receiving everything that you have. Because we're now in a marriage relationship and your strength is now my strength. Your wisdom is my wisdom. Your joy is my joy. Your peace is my peace. Your health and healing and Zoe life are my life and it gives me life. Your abundant supply and provision and wealth is mine. But I can't stop there. Lord, I give back to you everything I am. It's not a lot to you, but... I give you everything I am. My life is yours. My breath is yours. My dreams and desires, I give them to you, Lord. My time, my hope, my energy, my gifts and my talents, my skills, my possessions, my money, anything you ask for, Lord, I give it all to you. I hold nothing back in this relationship. I completely give everything over to you as you completely give everything over to me. And that is also something that is usually forgotten in communion. As people are taking the communion, they're taking it very one-sided and thinking of his part. But it's supposed to be equal. That we give everything back to him. So every time you take that bread and juice, thank God and be a receiver of everything that he has and all of his provision. But don't hold back anything and say, Lord, in return, I am giving you back everything I am, everything I have, every ounce of life, all my breath, all my possessions. Nothing is mine anymore. It's all yours. Hallelujah. And in that equal exchange, now God can come into your life fully and bless everything and and use you for his glory and bless you more because you haven't held back anything. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we will stop there as we are about ready to receive communion now.